Judge Layton, thank you so much. I think all of you should know that uh, on October 21st, I believe, Judge Layton will be 101 years old. Wow. And uh, I don't think many of us are as lucid as he is. So again, we've had, I think, a, a really remarkable morning. and. Uh, uh, it's going to be hard to top. We have more on tap for this afternoon. Uh, we have lunch for everybody next door. Uh, it, you're welcome to go get it. Bring it back in here. We're running a little bit late. We're going to try to catch up, so I'm asking you to eat as quickly and efficiently as you can. Okay, thank you. So the next person that's going to present today um, will be your keynote speaker, uh, Steve Bright. Uh, we've, I think almost everybody's talked about him all morning today. Uh, Steve Bright is uh, currently teaching at Yale Law School, but he is the um, founder and for longtime president of the Southern Center for Human Rights in Atlanta. And uh, for, Steve used to teach uh, criminal procedure at this law school. He was actually um, my criminal procedure professor. And, most schools have a, um, your typical criminal procedure class. Steve Bright teaches a little bit differently. It's called criminal procedure, race, and poverty. Uh, and so I'm not sure of many, uh, many other places where that happens. Um, but uh, for the, the work that um, he's done, we heard about people like um, Gary Drinker. There are, um, you know, not dozens, but hundreds of other examples of Steve and his organization coming through uh, in a time of need. And uh, I'll tell you just really quickly, uh, Steve, last year in my uh, criminal law class at the University of North Carolina, I played a, uh, a little bit of a letter. I read a little bit of a letter that Steve will talk about in a moment um, about his representation of a client. And then I played uh, a short video of Steve talking about the importance of doing public service work and being a public defender. So I knew people liked it because of how many emails I received. But um, it turns out that we had a public defender mentorship program, and it was the next week. And they usually have like 14 or 15 people. There are 90 people in our 1L class, uh, in, in my section of 1L class. There were like 85 people at the meeting. Everybody's like, I want to be a public defender. And uh, last summer, we, we literally had like 14 or 15 people going to public defender offices. And when I looked at my criminal law evaluations, the thing that consistently came up was the most, um, the most unbelievable moment of their 1L year, not our class, but their 1L year was hearing that letter and uh, hearing you speak and just how powerful it was. And so uh, Steve's ability to touch people as he has in this room is unknown. Uh, I mean, it's sort of unmeasurable. And uh, Steve, you are my hero. And uh, thank you so much for being here today. And uh, we can't wait to hear from you. Thank you very much, Rob, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I guess I will start with that letter that Rob mentioned. Uh, May 2012, I get a letter. I get letters like this every day. But I think it tells why what we're talking about here today is so important. This was from a young woman named Shauna Shackelford. Uh, her home burned down in 2009. Uh, she lost everything. She literally did not have a change of clothing after uh, her place burned down. Uh, she was homeless. Uh, she had to get a couple of jobs to, to, to get herself back on track. And then in March, after this had happened, she was indicted for arson. And she was charged with arson. She wrote me this letter and described that. And then she said this, I was homeless for a while after the fire and forced to rely upon friends uh, to offer a place to sleep from time to time. I worked really hard at two jobs and finally got another place to stay. I got one in April 2010 and I continued to attend my community college part time. I applied for a public defender. The lawyer I got was incompetent and that was apparent from the minute I met him. I complained and three months later, another lawyer was added to my case. She constantly encouraged me. Me, a person who has never been committed of any, all capitals, crime of any sort to take 15 years in prison offered by the prosecution. I declined. I got another lawyer. 
uh, who miss court dates for weeks at a time. I would come to court and the lawyer wouldn't be there and I'd be told to come back the next week or I'd be told to come back uh, a week after that. As a result of all these times that I kept going to court, I lost both of my jobs. I have no place to go. I'm a certified nurse's aide, but I cannot find employment due to this arson charge hanging over me. I don't know how to fix this. I've asked to be placed in jail until this is over. I fear that I may take my own life or I may die from the conditions of being homelessness. That request that I be admitted to jail has been denied as well. The last offer was 10 years on probation and a restitution of a half a million. I told my attorney, absolutely not. And he told me, this may be it. This may be the best offer you're going to get. And I told him, I don't care if I sit in prison for the rest of my life, I'm not going to accept blame for something I didn't do. A guilty plea, even with no jail time, will ruin my life more than this case has already. It means I could never use my degree to be a nurse. I already knew the collateral consequences of this conviction. I knew I would never be able to use my degree effectively or ever be taken seriously again. I've had over 20 continuances. I've lost jobs, I lost, both my, I lost my home, I lost both my dogs. I now sleep in my car, but I'm gonna lose that because I can't make the next payment on the car. I'm tired, I'm beaten, I don't understand how to fight this. My only question is, what do I do now that I have no way to care for myself, no place to go, and a lawyer who's totally uninterested in my case? I just don't want to die without someone knowing what these people have done to me and how I have cried and pleaded and begged for help in the last three years. I'm only 23, Mr. Bright. And I have fought to stay afloat for the last three years. I just want to know what there is left for me to do while I'm still here. This is what the needs that people have that need public defenders. And what was happening here in this place, Carrollton, Georgia, was that this young woman had been given a public defender and a public defender's office that could put down a guilty plea. They were good at that but they couldn't try an arson case. Arson cases are difficult. In fact, Nancy Gertner on the film was talking about the arson case that she thought when they had that testimony about the dog smelling the fire, this doesn't look quite right to me. Uh, we know uh, because Todd Willingham, for one, executed by the state of Texas an arson case where we know that a lot of the science used in that was junk science. A lot of it was old wives' tales and uh, old thoughts that have been completely discredited now. Uh, like that the glass uh, found at the scene had these patterns on them and this pattern means that an accelerant's been used. No, what the pattern means is that when glass is really hot and you spray cold water on it, it cracks the way the glass was cracked. But the jury had been told this was indication uh, uh, that an accelerant. So you've got to know the science. You've got to consult with the experts. You've got to do discovery. You've got to review the photographs. None of that had been done in this case because this public defender office had so many cases that they just, and they had nobody knew how to try an arson case. So the only way to try one was for somebody to stop and take the time to learn to try one. Well, we, we took Ms. Shackelford's case, the part about feeling like she was gonna die. Um, as many of these cases I get, I think that was just more than I could take. And, and for her really, her whole life, almost like a death penalty case, her whole life was in the balance here. Whether she'd ever be able to be a nurse, whether she'd ever be able to live in the community, or whether she would be forever branded uh, as an arson for the rest of her life. And then I realized, I don't know how to try an arson case. I haven't tried an arson case in 40 years. And then what, what in the hell have I got myself into here? I uh, got another lawyer in my office, and we started consulting with experts and all that. Finally, we, we, we did what the public defender should have done. We, cons we, we found an insurance lawyer in Atlanta who normally represented insurance companies, uh, but he came on our team. And now we had an expert in arson. Uh, and we had somebody who could be in touch with all the leading experts uh, in the country just with a phone call. Uh, and basically, the long and short of it is we ended up taking our whole case, the witnesses we had found, the salt of the earth witnesses, uh, the, the fire science stuff that we had done, all of this took it to the prosecutor, showed it to him, and the case is dismissed. 
And so now Ms. Shackelford goes on with her life. Now she's working 40 hours a week providing home health care to mentally ill people uh, in, in Georgia. Uh, she's back in college. She's still working to get her nursing degree, but all serendipitously, all serendipitously, just like Gary Drinkard and I were talking about uh, this, that uh, he just had the good luck to have lawyers available who could spend the time, our office, do the investigation uh, that was necessary to prove his innocent, uh, innocence at his second trial. Uh, somebody else who took the same tact in Alabama after being convicted of murder said, I want the death penalty. It's the only way I'm going to get a, a, a decent lawyer and get an appeal. Unfortunately, he didn't get a decent lawyer. Uh, the lawyer missed the statute of limitations for filing for federal habeas, so he ended up not getting uh, any review uh, uh, of his case. Some lawyers in Houston, Texas, excuse me, some poor people accused of crimes in Houston, Texas, have the misfortune of being assigned a lawyer named Jerome Godnich. Mr. Godnich has missed the statute of limitations for filing a federal habeas corpus petition in three death penalty cases, meaning that those clients have absolutely no review of their cases, those clients no, no longer in life, had no review of their cases by life tenure federal judges, only by elected state Texas judges who are uh, somewhat blind uh, to constitutional violations. A question I've always asked about that is why, when he missed it the first time, wasn't he suspended from practice? Why, when he missed it the second time, why didn't the Texas bar, why didn't the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, why didn't they do something to protect the public when he missed it the third time, and he gave us his reason that the file stamp machine at the courthouse didn't work, and the court came back and said, that's the reason you gave last time, and the file stamp machine worked last time, and it works this time just as well. No action taken. And the, lawyer, the judges in Houston, you could have said, at the very least, the judges in Houston can take this guy off the list of people who are going to get appointed to represent people. Today, He's handling 350 plus cases in Houston, in Harris County. Three of those cases are capital cases. Obviously, to these judges, the complete incompetence of this lawyer means absolutely nothing to them at all. This is the same court where, as was discussed earlier, uh, we have the law of uh, sleeping lawyers, three different people sentenced to death uh, in Houston. Uh, whose lawyers slept during the trial. Um, one time, Judge Schaefer, the chief criminal judge, said, how can you preside over a case where the lawyer is sleeping? It's a death penalty case. You're, how can you do this, judge? He said, well, the lawyer guarantees your right, uh, excuse me, the Constitution guarantees your right to a lawyer, but it doesn't guarantee the lawyer has to be awake. That, that's a strict constructionist, if, if ever there was one. And in all kinds of cases, we see violations of the right to counsel. Two of the most disturbing things to me have been two 16-year-old children with IQs in the mid-40s, sentenced as adults to prisons. First one I heard about because a fellow in the Department of Juvenile Justice called me and said, this kid's got an IQ of 43. These kids had no understanding of the process, no understanding of what they were going through when they pled guilty and got these adult sentences. You stay in the juvenile system until you're 17, and then you move over. And this guy told me, this lawyer said, if you guys don't take this case, do something about it. This kid is just going to be a walking victim when he gets into the adult system. The lawyers hadn't spent enough time with their clients to realize that they were intellectually disabled. They had, didn't even know that they're clients were. We see people who are arrested. We talked about bail and how important bail is and the work that Bob has done to try to get bail in places. I, I, I see people who stay in jail for weeks or months without bail, without ever seeing a lawyer, without ever seeing a judge. Uh, I've always said that, you know, with regard to bond, it proves uh, one thing uh, that there are no small cases in the criminal justice system. There are no small, even the misdemeanor cases, there are no small cases. Jacqueline Winbron, 
uh, detained after her arrest, first arrest ever in her life. She doesn't have a lawyer to ask for bond or to ask for a bond reduction. She's held in jail. She desperately wants out of jail because her husband is on dialysis and she's the person who takes her husband to dialysis. But she can't file a motion because she doesn't have a lawyer. And now she's getting more and more desperate. Finally, her husband dies as a result of not getting his treatment. Now she would like to get out just to go to the funeral, but she still has no way to apply to the court. Finally, a while after that, a prisoner rights organization, not a public defender office, they don't have a public defender office, it's some county up near Syracuse, New York. This is not just, you know, the deep south, it's Syracuse, New York. Uh, finally, a prisoner rights lawyer finds out about her, files a motion, she's released on her personal promise to come back. That's how hard it would be to get bail for her. She could have been released the day after she got arrested, the day she was arrested. Uh, and a short time later, the charges are dismissed. So she hasn't been convicted of anything. But she couldn't have been punished much more severely. When we talk about the process is the punishment, that's what we're talking about. The more typical case is my friend Chris Phillips, who was arrested in Atlanta. This young man barely struggling to get by, he's schizophrenic. Uh, but he had a job at a liquor store as a clerk. He was living in a boarding house. He had a room, but he gets picked up, held for two weeks in the jail, and then he's released. He's never really charged with anything, never sees a judge, never sees a lawyer. But when he gets home, of course, all his stuff is out on the front lawn because he hadn't paid his, his monthly rent. He goes back to the liquor store. He doesn't have a job anymore because he's missed two weeks of work. And now Chris, who's really struggling right on the margins of life, now he's homeless. And now he's going to be disadvantaged, without a job, without a place to live, and living uh, in the parks and other places where homeless people live in Atlanta, very, very many of them. And just yesterday, the Supreme Court of New Jersey held that the lawyer, held that a client who met his lawyer on the morning of trial, and the judge would not grant a continuance, and the case goes to trial with the lawyer being appointed that morning, that that did not deny his right to counsel. And only one justice, what a disgrace, one justice dissents in this case. State versus Terrence Miller, if you want to look it up. Gideon versus Wainwright was about two things. It was about the right to counsel, and it was about the idea that everybody stands equal before the law. The same day Gideon was decided, the court decided Douglas versus California, in which the court repeated what it had said before in Griffin versus Illinois, there can be no equal justice when the kind of justice a person gets depends upon the amount of money he or she has. Many people forget the historical context of Gideon. This was 1963. This was when the southern states were in massive resistance to Brown versus Board of Education. One of the important things to learn in law school is that just because the Supreme Court says something doesn't mean that it happens anywhere. I learned this early in my career when I was practicing before a judge, not a very good one, and uh, a case of his had been reversed by the United States Supreme Court. It was a really big deal. It had been in the newspapers and all that, and I'm there one day, and everybody's talking about the case, and the judge said, well, you know, he said, I've been a judge now for 20-some-odd years, and this is the first time the Supreme Court ever reversed me. He said, I reverse them every day. Uh, so he put it, put it in perspective. Uh, and basically, uh, there's been the same resistance to Gideon. Uh, with Brown, it was a hard-fought battle because there was enforcement in the federal courts, and Skelly Wright and other great judges in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals at that time, certainly not today, uh, but at that time, uh, really desegregated the schools almost school by school, county by county, place by place. But there was no similar kind of enforcement. Uh, states like Georgia and Alabama and Arkansas and Texas, I mean, basically just uh, conscripted lawyers. If you remember the bar, you had to take some court-appointed cases. You weren't expected to really do much with them, but you could check off that box that said the person uh, had a lawyer. Um, we all know that now, uh, 50 years after Gideon, the kind of justice, Judge, it's so great to see you. Take good care. Um, 
the kind of justice you have depends so much on the amount of money uh, you have. Uh, 50 years after Gideon, we see courts where there's no counsel at all, where people are processed through the courts without any lawyer involved in the cases at all. We see courts with lawyers every now and then. Like in Kentucky, 30% of the misdemeanor cases, people represented by lawyers. Florida, about a third of the cases, people not represented by lawyers. So sometimes you get a lawyer, sometimes you don't. Depends upon where you are. If you're in a municipal court, that's the cash cow for the local community, and you're charged with a traffic offense, you're charged with driving under the influence, whatever, you probably are not gonna see a lawyer there if you can't uh, afford one. Uh, courts with no lawyers at bail hearings, as I said, all over the country, and then the meet them and plead them, courts where people literally meet a lawyer, talk to them for five or 10 minutes, plead guilty, sentenced by the judge, and that's the entirety of their experience with a lawyer or with the court system. And flat fee contracts, I can't believe when I heard that Washington was thinking, or, or Massachusetts, was thinking about flat fee contracts. I mean, this is the absolute pits where you pay lawyers a flat fee to handle, in Georgia, 150 cases for $50,000. Do the math. Uh, it's not much money. And you can keep your whole private practice. So just like Steve Singer described with those part-time public defenders in New Orleans, you've got lawyers who, they're going to get their 50000 no matter how good or how poorly, how well or how poorly they represent their indigent clients. Uh, and so the incentive is going to be to spend all your time on your other cases, your divorces, your title searches, whatever it is uh, that you can do uh, in addition to that. Uh, as the Supreme Court said, we have a system of pleas, not a system of trials. In Georgia, only 2% of the poor people, cases involving poor people accused of crime, go to, go to, go to trial. They're either dismissed or they're pled, uh, but they don't go to trial. And that comment that Bob made this morning that I was going to make uh, 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 about triage. I keep hearing this all the time, triage. I practiced with a public defender service in the District of Columbia back in the 70s, and we never used the word triage in our office. And I never heard of it. It's a totally inappropriate, uh, as Bob said, concept uh, for uh, a lawyer. On the battlefield, yes, you might patch somebody up and hold them until the surgeon gets there or until some doctor can treat them. And yes, you make decisions that this person is not going to recover and this person's going to be OK. Uh, but in triaging in the courts, what we're deciding is that these people are just going to be short trip. We're just going to meet them and plead them. We're just going to process them through so we can spend time on the other, quote, more important cases. But to the people involved, there are no unimportant cases. This is people's liberty. Even in a materialistic, selfish society like ours, liberty amounts to something It's important. And it shouldn't just be taken away like that. The head of the Missouri Public Defender told the governor and the judges and the legislators there, triage has replaced justice in Missouri's courts. People languish in jail for weeks or months without a lawyer. Attorneys are forced to take shortcuts that lead to wrongful convictions. Triage is, um, um, as I said, not an appropriate concept in, in this situation. Uh, it has a tremendous impact on communities of color. Uh, when I was practicing as a public defender, we had about 200,000 men, women, and children in prisons and jails in this country. Today, as many of you know, 2.3 million. 2.3 million. Uh, the criminal justice system is a part of our society that's been least affected by the civil rights movement. You know, in the part of the country where I practice in the South, Georgia, Alabama, west of there, and Texas, and so forth, you know, a lot of things have changed. We now have African Americans, and the judge was talking about the one African American representing Chicago. We now have, my, my congressman was once beaten to within uh, an inch of his life trying to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Uh, today, John Lewis is one of the most uh, respected members of Congress. We have African Americans in the state legislature on county commissions on uh, city councils and so forth, but I go in the courtroom and it looks like we're back in 1940 or 1950. Uh, it, 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 it looks like a slave ship is docked outside the courthouse. All of a sudden, all these African American men handcuffed together like slaves, dressed in jumpsuits, with no dignity whatsoever, hauled into the court, brought in, put in the jury box, put in the first couple of rows of the bleachers, 
And a couple of, maybe one lawyer, maybe a couple of lawyers come down and go down and talk to each one of them. Of course, these, these are not confidential communications. This is not representation, as we understand representation to be, as a term of art, is it? And then just a short time later, they'll go before the judge and they'll plead guilty and just be there for a, for a trial. And you'll see that even in a community like Columbus, Georgia, for example, 35% African American, and yet everybody in the front of the court, except the person on trial. The judge is white, the prosecutors are white, the court appointed lawyers are white, and the jury is all white. How could this be? I thought you couldn't discriminate in selecting jurors. That's another one of those Supreme Court cases nobody follows, you know? The one that says you can't discriminate in picking juries, and everywhere I go, they discriminate in picking juries, and everybody knows. We just had the Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit uphold a case in which the prosecutor in Alabama gets so many peremptory strikes, 20 peremptory strikes, all 20 against African Americans. All 20, you think that's a coincidence? And the court said, well, he had a race neutral reason for each strike. That man's gonna die. I mean, this, is, this man's gonna die because he's been to the court of last resort. Um, I see, go to a courtroom where people are being interviewed. Are they eligible for a public defender? And they're not eligible because we've got the standards down so low. And so then the, 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 the administrator for the public defender office takes the person over and has them talk to the prosecutor. Now, wait a minute. The fact that they're not eligible doesn't mean they're qualified to represent themselves. It means theoretically, at least, they can afford a lawyer. Of course, this is totally theoretical because if you're just barely living above the poverty line, you're not going to be able to hire a lawyer for five to, five to $50,000. So uh, it, it, it's something of a, of a fiction. Uh, but Gideon versus Wainwright didn't say people who don't meet the eligibility standards by some legislature. It says people who cannot afford a lawyer. So if the person goes to the attorneys in town and finds out they can't hire anybody, that judge is between a rock and a hard place. He's either got to meet the constitutional requirement of appointing a lawyer or violate it by letting this person go pro se. And of course, there's another case, Ferretta versus California, that says judges are not to allow people to represent themselves in cases. Uh, and yet I see this happening all the time. Um, in Cordillo, Georgia, they'll have the whole line of people all pleading guilty at one time. You know, six, eight, 10 people all pleading guilty, and the judges are giving them all their rights together, and they're all just right. Guilty, 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 guilty. Taking all these pleas. And then the prosecutor says, I want fines, I want uh, prison time, whatever they want. And then the guy standing at the other end, uh, ostensibly the lawyer for these people, says, and be sure to add the $50 public defender fee. Now I'm standing in the middle of the line, I'm like, wait a minute, who's on my side here? Prosecutors just asked for all these fines and things, and then this guy's asked for fines. He hasn't said a word on my behalf while well, I've been standing here. In California, they use low bids. That's another low bid place. And uh, a place like Fresno, where the bids are to the lowest bidder. One lawyer out there said that he dealt with 70% of his cases by pleading the people guilty at the first appearance in court after a 30-second conversation. It's called the Walmart model of representation. And uh, in Michigan, and Minnesota, they call what they do there when they take a lot of pleas, they call it make justice, uh, that they're handling people. It does not speak well of the criminal justice system when it is compared to Walmart and to fast food restaurants. And it is also not fair to Walmart and to fast food restaurants <laughs> to compare them with the criminal justice uh, system. I think this meet them and plead them more than anything else that I see shows the utter corruption of the system. Because when you're doing meet them and plead them, the judge knows there's no representation going on here. There's no interview, there's no investigation, there's no looking into collateral consequences and whether or not this person's gonna uh, not be able to uh, keep their job or be deported or not be able to live in housing or whatever it may be. There's nothing like that going on. The lawyer knows nothing about the person. Nothing about the party, no, nothing about the charges. They're just a messenger. Here's the plea offer. Here's what you can get. Bang, bang, bang. The prosecutor knows this is not lawyering. The lawyer knows this is not lawyering. And let me tell you, all those people sitting in the audience watching court, 
They know it's not lawyering. They know this is a farce, that this is an assembly line, that this lawyer is not there in their best interest, but it's serving the interests of the court, just like the clerk, in terms of just moving people through the system. And yet we see this all over the place. We know what to do about this. It's no secret what to do about it. The American Bar Association's 10 standards for a public, defender, uh, public uh, defense system uh, set those out. Uh, one of the first and one of the most important is independence. We just recently had a public defender in Georgia. This is one of the most extraordinary things I've ever seen. This public defender who had complained about um, had actually filed a motion in which he'd asked that he and his office be declared ineffective, per se ineffective. And he said the reason is because we have two vacant positions. They've been vacant for over a year. And no lawyers have been hired, so the two lawyers left, me and this other lawyer who's a total incompetent, who's the, the public defender, uh, who doesn't, this is someone who doesn't represent people poor. He didn't say this, but I'll say this. This is not someone who represents people poorly. This is someone who doesn't represent people at all. I mean, we went to court one day when she was supposedly representing people. We thought the clients were pro se because they were talking directly to the prosecutor and the judge. And it turned out, no, she was her lawyer, but she's just sitting there taking notes. So... Of course, the motion's denied. He is standing before a judge in September, and the courtroom has packed 178 people on the calendar. And can you possibly handle 178 individual people in one day? And he's representing over 50. And these are people with whom he has an ongoing attorney-client relationship. The judge is on the bench. The private lawyer's cases are being taken care of so they can get out of there and get back to their other private business. Uh, and he's handed an envelope, and he opens the envelope. And in it is a letter from the chief public defender, and it said, you are hereby discharged from your responsibilities as a public defender. He's fired in open court with his client sitting right there behind him. And he goes to the judge, and he said, judge, I've got this letter. I just got fired, <laughs> so I'm leaving. Now, in any system that even pretended to be about justice, you would have a constitutional crisis of the first magnitude. You would wait a minute. There are 50 some odd people here who've just had an ongoing attorney-client relationship interrupted, severed, just like that, while they're sitting in the courtroom. So you would think you'd have to call everything off here. Is the lawyer going to represent these people anyway because he's got an ongoing attorney-client relationship with them? Are we going to continue these cases because these people, I mean, don't have a lawyer now? We didn't even skip a beat. Judge Fierce didn't even skip a beat. He just went around and called the calendar. The lawyer's gone. He walks out the door. And most of the cases that he had pled out that day. So obviously the lawyer was just window dressing. He wasn't there for any other purpose. They pled out his cases. Um, independence is critical. In a, in, a, in a system that was independent, you would reward a lawyer like that for standing up and pointing out the problems with the system. In a system which the public defender serves at the pleasure of the governor and is appointed by the governor, you don't want a guy like that. That guy's a troublemaker for raising these problems publicly about what's wrong and why clients are not getting good representation. Uh, we know we have to have structure, we have to have, and a lot of states still don't have. I mean, Alabama, a lot of Texas still, no public defender offices. The judges are just appointing lawyers and some on contracts, some of very low hourly rates, not the ones you heard about here uh, in Massachusetts. And of course, who are those lawyers loyal to? They're loyal to the judge. They're not loyal to the, the judges who they're dependent upon uh, for their future business. Uh, resources. Somebody said, we don't need any more money. We do need more money. Public defense is so grossly underfunded that it's, that it's just, uh, you know, it's interesting to me. They were always being told the whole time of my career at the bar, from being a public defender to now, we never have enough money for indigent defense. We just never have enough money. We have this crisis in Georgia, we didn't have any money, we just don't have any money. Just don't have any money. We always have enough money for indigent prosecutions, <laughs> which is, I think, being done by the same government that's responsible for the defense, if it's poor people under Gideon. But of course, the 
great problem that I don't know will ever be resolved is how do you get a government, whether it's the state government, whether it's the local government, whether it's the municipal government trying to enrich its coffers, how do you get that government to, prov and, and, and they're trying to convict, fine, imprison, maybe even execute people? Why would you give the person a lawyer to defeat that very purpose? Why give them a good lawyer to defeat that very purpose? And there's no question now. I mean, this case in uh, New Jersey, I said, you know, any decent prosecutor would have joined in the defense motion for a continuance. I said, wait a minute, this person can't try a case. He, he doesn't even know the client yet. We're not going to be a part of this. But of course, what we see today is prosecutors taking advantage of the poor quality of representation uh, that people uh, get. Uh, in Miami, when a judge uh, let a public defender turn down a case because he said, ethically, I cannot take this case. I have too great a caseload. This is a habitual offender case. It's very complicated. If I take this case, I will be rendering incompetent representation of that person, or I won't be able to competently represent the many hundreds of clients I already have. And the judge said, sure. The judge said, sure. Prosecution appeals. What is the prosecution's interest in appealing that case? And gets it reversed which tells every public defender, as best I can tell, the ethical rules that apply to every other lawyer don't apply to you. Fortunately, the Florida Supreme Court reversed back in June and held that actually public defenders do, and the Missouri Supreme Court has held this, have the same uh, ethical obligations. Training, critically important. And Gideon's Promise, this program that uh, John uh, Rapping uh, has, uh, is, is doing so much now to get us people in public defender offices and all of you that are students here, you look into that because it's a way to get into public defender offices where the need is the greatest and provide uh, help uh, for people. Um, let me just say a couple of things because I, I, don't, I, don't, I was going to spend a little time talking about the Justice Department and how I think it's wasting money uh, giving the RAND Corporation $334,000 to study whether holistic defense works. I mean, come on, of course it works. We've known that for a long time. But most public defender offices can't afford to do it. So what difference does it make? Why do we spend $334,000 helping people in the trenches? People are talking about, oh, we ought to study indigent defense. We need another commission to study. If there's another commission to study indigent defense, I mean, we've had thousands, commissions, academics, public interest organizations, American Bar Association, all of these people, and everyone's come to the same conclusion. Do we need a commission to study whether there's a relationship between smoking and health? I mean, maybe this commission could take on both those issues. Maybe global warming, too, uh, or climate change. The Attorney General talks about how bad it is, uh, and yet, uh, so little is offered, and if he goes off on this commission, well, uh, it's just, you know, that's that. Let me talk about a couple of cases real quickly, and I'll stop. James Fisher, 26 and a half years on death row in Oklahoma. Represented at his first trial by a lawyer who tried 24 other cases that month, that's September. No opening at either phase, spoke only nine words at the penalty phase. And he's sentenced to death, and it's upheld by the Oklahoma courts. 19 years later, the Court of Appeals of the 10th Circuit says, this is abject, ineffective assistance of counsel. This man doesn't even appear to be guilty of the crime. So they send it back for a retrial. 2005, he gets his retrial. Now he gets another Oklahoma lawyer. This is Oklahoma City. They give you a great lawyer in Oklahoma City. This time, the lawyer was a, uh, a drunkard, a cocaine abuser. Uh, and he threatened Fisher to a fist fight uh, before the trial. It wasn't a real good attorney-client relationship here. Uh, and he gets sentenced to death again. This time, it didn't take quite as long, 2009, even the Oklahoma court said no, no, new trial. So here this guy is, 26 and a half years later, after he's been arrested, 26, and we still don't have a constitutional determination of whether he's guilty or not because he's never had a competent lawyer represent him at the guilt phase of his trial. What's the prosecution do? So I'll tell you what, Mr. Fisher, if you'll agree to plead guilty and leave Oklahoma today and never come back to the state of Oklahoma, we'll let you do that. Now, if you're Mr. Fisher, and you've had the two trials you've had, uh, how important is your innocence going to be to you at this point? 
and he got the bus ticket and left. Robert Holsley, just recently upheld by the 11th Circuit, his lawyer drank a quart of vodka every day during the trial because he was totally preoccupied with the fact he's about to be indicted for stealing client funds, and he was indicted, disbarred, and, and went to prison even for failing to do that. Um, as a result of this uh, failure and neglect of Holsey's case, uh, the lawyer fails to put on any evidence about Robert's mental image, uh, intellectual impairments. Uh, and also that as a child he was, to quote Rosemary Barquette's dissent, as a child he'd been subject to abuse so severe, so frequent, and so notorious that his neighbors called his childhood home the torture chamber. The court said, well, under the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, uh, we have to defer to the Georgia courts, which said, well, it didn't really make any difference. The lawyer was incompetent, but we don't think it affected the outcome, and we defer to them, and so forth. Um, just if you switch those two cases, one of the most important things in Fisher's case was that the court held that the Anti-Terrorism Act did not apply that that deference did not apply. If it had, he almost certainly would have been executed by Oklahoma. On the other hand, if Robert Holsey's case had been tried back before the Anti-Terrorism Act uh, took effect, this was the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act signed into law by President Clinton in April of 1996, uh, Holsey almost certainly would have gotten relief uh, for the kind of representation. And this is, this is what the vagaries of the system are. Uh, in terms of what date did you file your petition? Well, if this law applies, you win. If, uh, if you apply they, if this law applies, you lose. Uh, and of course, the, the, the vagaries of what kind of lawyers uh, you get. Uh, Mark Bogman's going to talk more about capital representation and representation in, in, in Pennsylvania. I want to end by just saying, what can we do about it? And I think one thing we can do about it is shine a light on it as we are doing here today. I mean, I hope that some media will pick up on the fact of what the New Jersey Supreme Court did and take them to uh, the proverbial cleaners with regard to it. Uh, we have to tell these stories. Uh, we have to litigate these claims. And we've done that successfully in a number of states, Florida and uh, Missouri, and uh, here, as you heard, in, in Massachusetts, actually the pioneering case uh, on caseloads and funding uh, and, and so forth. Attorneys, those of you who are going to be attorneys, or our attorneys, I was saying no matter what you do, you have a responsibility for the representation that poor people get in criminal cases. Lawyers have a monopoly on legal services. And it's not just a get rich quick scheme for lawyers, it is that. But there comes with a monopoly responsibility. If you're going to have a monopoly, if you're going to get filthy rich off the monopoly where lawyers make millions of dollars a year and have so many houses they can't keep up with them all, you certainly have to make sure that the system works for the least among us, that you make sure that public defender programs are independent, that they're funded, that they have training, and all of those things. And every lawyer, every lawyer, whether you're an academic, whether you're a big law firm lawyer, whether you're a prosecutor even, whether you're a legislator, every lawyer has a responsibility to make this system work because it's out of sight and out of mind for most people. It's not going to be a popular cause. Robert Kennedy said the poor person accused of a crime has no lobby. The only lobby can be the members of the bar who understand the importance of the right to counsel if this system is ever going to work. And finally, it's individual people who respond as public defenders to the Shana Shacklefords, to the Gary Drinkers, and to other people and go into communities uh, and represent people. Uh, and that's what's really the day by day in the trenches representation of people uh, is what is making a difference in New Orleans. We still got a long way to go. This is not something that's gonna be accomplished in my lifetime, I know that. It's not probably gonna be accomplished in your lifetime. Uh, but this idea of counsel, this idea of equal justice, this is at least a, a statement of the kind of society we would like to have, the kind of people we would like to be. As Justice Brennan said, these are the lodestar of our aspirations. And it's bigger than any of us, but we've got to each try to move it in that direction. They say, you know, they say the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice. I, I, I think when uh, Dr. King said that, uh, and Theodore Parker, who he was quoted, who said they, they didn't anticipate Fox News. Uh, the, 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 the arc of the moral universe is only going to bend towards justice 
if people push on it, pull on it, whatever, hard enough to make it bend towards justice. And I would suggest to you that by going in, if you haven't read Gilbert King's great book, Devil in the Grove, about Thurgood Marshall going down to Groveland, Florida and representing African-American youths charged with rape, putting his life on the line, we're not asked to do anything like that today. Nothing like that. Um, you're following in the footsteps of Justice Marshall and, and Charles Hamilton Houston and certainly Judge George Layton and so many other people who've gone before us, got us to where we are, and now we have to get the rest of the way home. Thank you very much. Thank you.